Greetings, and welcome back to the podcast. This episode, we are joined by Mr. Ian McGregor, president of Northwest Capital Partners, a family office that invests in undiscovered and undervalued assets. Prior to Northwest Capital, Mr. McGregor was the founder, CEO, and chairman of Northwest Refining, a 50% partner in the Northwest Redwater Partnership, a roughly $25 billion bitumen refining complex located in Alberta's industrial heartland. Mr. McGregor has also been the founder of Enhanced Energy, Ambient, and Shackleton Exploration, and is currently developing a real estate development titled Carrig Ridge, located halfway between the city of Calgary and Banff. Mr. McGregor is also the founder of the Canadian Museum of Making, a roughly 20,000 square foot internationally recognized museum with a world-class collection of African metalwork and machinery dating back to the Industrial Revolution, which also includes an extensive collection of early oil fill equipment. Mr. McGregor received his Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Calgary in 1971. Among other things, we sat down and discussed refineries, museums, and real estate. A few lessons from 50 years in business. Enjoy. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This podcast is sponsored by HeadRacingCanada.com. In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is offering European factory performance ski gear from its online storefront by passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info on the 2024 collection and get your high-performance ski gear for the upcoming season. We can start if you're ready. Good morning, Mr. E. McGregor. Oh, hi. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really appreciate your time. I know yeah. it's valuable. So. No problem. Thanks for having me. You are, for the listener, the CEO of Northwest Capital Partners. But if you were to maybe explain it in a nutshell, how would you describe Northwest Capital Partners? Uh, you know, it's a, we, we've been doing the same thing. I've been doing it for, for more than 40 years now. But w- what we do is we we look for opportunity in some place that's undiscovered. Those things usually have lots of risk with them. People immediately default to inventions and technology. That That's not what we do. What we do is take things that have been done before and apply them in unique ways or because of our experience, we can see opportunity that other people can't see sometimes. And so usually it's long, complicated, and uh, rewarding at the end if we do it right. If the earth was flat, we work right on the edge and we don't fall off, but we're damn close to the edge sometimes. And out on the edge of the earth, stuff is really cheap. And so we can, we can get opportunities out there that other people think, Oh, that's too risky, too complicated. Oh, this is that and the other thing. And that's the kind of stuff we like because we can buy it for nothing. No one else wants it. So if somebody else wants it, we don't have enough money to buy it. So we go on to the next one. So usually we're working on things that are, other people are saying there's something wrong with in an, in a material way, and our job is to try and see if we can solve the problems and build a business around that. You're also a pretty interesting person. You, if I'm correct, you're an entrepreneur, an engineer, you real estate developer. You have a museum. You're a boxer on Saturdays. If but you are a whole bunch of things wrapped up in one. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I go where the fun is, so if it looks like it's going to be fun, then I do it. And if it looks like it's not going to be fun, sometimes you have to try it for a while before you decide that. But if it ain't fun, I'm not doing it. How would you describe yourself? Well, I'm somebody whose uh, mother and dad were very careful in how I, I'm an only child. I was People who looked after me were very careful, and they saw what I was interested in, and they made sure I could do that. Uh, they made sure I was in an environment that uh, I could make lots of mistakes. And as long as I tried my hardest, it didn't make any difference. You know, I'm lucky enough to be, have an okay IQ so I can read books and memorize them if I have to. And, mm-hmm. and so they encouraged me to do that. And, and I'm just lucky. And so they encouraged me to have the life that I've got. Yeah. If I'm correct, you're an engineer by training from the UFC in the beginning? Yeah. I went to UFC. Yeah. And I, uh, I went there because my mom, couldn't go to university. She didn't have enough money. She was smart enough to go, but she couldn't go. So from the time I was 
able to understand English. She was telling me I was going to university. I could fix any kind of machine when I was a kid. So my dad would work in a machine shop and I was always going with him and learn how to fix stuff so I could fix motorcycles. Okay. So she decided that's what mechanical engineers did. So that's why I'm a mechanical engineer. She told me what I was going to do. <laughs> when you graduated, what did you do after school? Did you go right into energy? Uh, no, I didn't. Well, I, I uh, you know, I always had a suspicion I was going to be unemployable back in the day, Calgary power, you know, used to come around when people were graduating and you'd go to these job interviews. So they'd have them over in the students union building. You go into these things and there'd be a bunch of people and they're giving you job interviews. So I get the job interview with Calgary power before I go. My mom says, if those guys are for you a job, you take it. They've got a great pension plan. That's going to be a good place to work. So I go in and talk to this guy. I think this guy's an idiot. I'm not working for these guys. So He's asking me all these questions and I'm trying to figure out how the hell do I get out of this interview? Because if, if he offers me a job, I got to tell mom I didn't take it. So I didn't want to do that. So I'm trying to figure out how do I get out of the room? And he's getting ready to offer me a job. He's got all these papers and stuff. He's bringing them up. I'm going to put them on the desk. I say, I got to go now. <laughs> so he's trying to stop me. Finally, the last memory I got of him is he's here with all these papers and I'm closing the door. Uh -huh. So I got home. Mom says, did he offer you a job? I say, no, no, he didn't. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I went to grad school. I worked for the summer for somebody. Went to grad school. Did that for about a year. And I'm not cut out to be a grad student. You know, I, I can memorize books okay, but that's not what I want to spend my life doing. So I was in the grad student's office one day and these two salesmen guy comes in with a, a little machine and they're asking the secretary in the grad student's office, is there somebody around here who could build a machine like that? So I'm listening to these guys and I think, I could do that. So I go over and say to the guy, I could build a machine like that. He says, how much you want? I look at it. I have no idea mm -hmm. anything about cost, what it costs going to do. I say 5,000 bucks. He says, okay, yeah, we'll do that. So I, I write the kind of contract that somebody who's never written a contract would write before I get this with them. And then I go home and my dad's there and I say, Hey, I need to borrow some money from you to want to start a machine shop. And uh, he says, how much? I say 2,500 bucks. I'm sure that's all the money he had in the world. He didn't say anything like you couldn't do it. You don't know what anything about business. He just said, sure. Yeah, go ahead. What kind of machines you want to buy? So I bought a lathe and a milling machine and a drill and rented a double crash and started building this machine. And, I had a vastly underestimated the cost of the machine, so we couldn't really do it for 5000 bucks. but it got me started, and after that, I was just fixing stuff. Never look back. Yeah. Were you aware of the uh, independent path you were taking at the time, kind of the entrepreneurial career? I never really thought about it in those terms. I mean, I was prepared for risk by my parents. There was no shame in anything that you failed at. There was only shame if you didn't try your hardest. So you had to be careful, because if you started doing something and you didn't try, then that wasn't going to go over too good. So when I started the thing, I always just assumed, you know, I'll be able to be okay at doing this. And it turned out I was okay at it. Uh. This was in your 20s. You started, it was a machine shop? Yeah. So like a welding shop, it's like, you know, we fix stuff. Anything was broken, bring it to us and we'll fix it. Over time, that evolved into a business that was doing lots of gas processing stuff. So building gas plants and field construction, design construction, all that stuff on a turf. I built lots of drilling rigs. So probably rig seven through 15 for precision. I built those rigs and, you know, we could build anything. We could figure out how to do it. So we had a couple of hundred people working in there. And then the national energy program came and we went broke when that was on. So I essentially lost everything, including my car. I had to take the bus home from the meeting, last meeting with the bank. The guy's saying, how are you getting home? I said, I got my car. He says, our car. So I had to take the bus <laughs> from the final meeting. <laughs> so what did you do after that? Started over again building small gas plants. So we knew how to build small gas plants. Uh, they'd go on a flare gas stream. And I had somehow met uh, Jack Gallagher from Dome. And so I went to Jack because we didn't have any money. We just got broke. So I was trying to get money for this thing. And Jack says, well, I'm interested, but uh, you're going to have to talk to Andy Younger. He's a guy, he's a, So Andy was like the grandfather of natural gas liquids in Western Canada. So I go talk to Andy and my partner goes and talks to him. And uh, Andy likes us. He likes the idea of what we're doing. We're building these really small, cheap gas plants that you can put on a flare. And you can take the liquids that are in these rich flares and essentially 
recover the liquids. So Andy likes the idea. It's, you know, it's some chicken shit compared to what he's done, but he likes it. And so uh, he helped us. And we never got any money from Jack, but we got a bit of money from Andy. And he worked with us all the way through. And we built a bunch of these little gas plants. And, and then that turned into an oil company. We started buying the, the underlying crappy reserves that they were on and uh, had an oil company called Solex for a while. You are a hands-on engineer. Hey, yeah, I, I mean, I can be. I, I, you know, I can do stuff if I have to. I don't do much anymore, but I know how to do it if I have to. How important do you think that technical competence was in your career in the sense that you actually knew how to make the things you were selling, so to speak? I think the ability to do that when it's combined with a commercial intellect where it's not just how do you design something, but it's how is that thing going to exist in the world and make money by being more efficient or better or last longer or do something. I think that interface is a really valuable place to, to be able to exist at. Was it important to be able to turn the wrench and, and be able to actually build the things you were selling? Do you think it was necessary to your success? I, I think you're more effective if you know how stuff works. And so, you know, like, I don't know how a computer works. So I'm never going to, I could, I could, I'm a good salesman. I could probably talk somebody into buying a computer off me, but it wouldn't be based on a transfer of value. And what I think is, if you know how stuff works, you can, you can do a better job of, of supporting the things that you sell. Yeah. One of the uh, bigger projects you worked on, if I'm correct, was the Northwest Sturgeon Refinery. Yeah. For the listener, maybe what is the Northwest Sturgeon Refinery and how'd you get involved? So we sold everything in, uh, and I've had the same partner for a long time, 30 years. And, uh, so we sold everything and, uh, it's about 2001 or two and we had a lot of stuff. And so we sold it all and that, that was a good experience. We got a bunch of money and, you know, tried to be in retired for a while. And I have done that a few times in my life. So usually I take, you know, three or six months off or something, just think about what I'm going to do before I start over again. So we sold everything. I'm sitting around getting sick of it sitting around and I'm hearing all this stuff for my whole life about diversification. So people are always talking about diversify this and do something that and all the politicians talk about it, all the bureaucrats talk about it, everybody's talking about it all the time. Nobody's doing a goddamn thing. Lougheed was the only guy that ever did anything. He did the, you know, the, the essential petrochemicals stuff we have. So I said, Chris, if I'm going to go back to work, I'm going to do something on the diversification theme. And, uh, I had enough money, so I didn't, it wasn't, I mean, people think all these things are about money in some way, but for me, this was like sort of I'm on a mission to change the economy. So uh, that doesn't mean I'm not trying to make money. For sure, I'm trying to make money, but I'm going to, I can direct that intellect wherever I want. So I'm going to do something with diversification. So I start going into it and, uh, you know, you look at the reserves in Alberta and we've got like a hundred and, I don't know, 70 billion or something of proven Benjamin reserves and all these guys are saying oh we got to send it to the states we got to get a process down there gulf coast has got all these refineries we'll never be able to compete with them we just can't do it it's just impossible you know you can't build those things here and then who owns refineries well shell owns them petro canada owns them and and uh, imperial owns them so they don't want somebody else entering that business that's not what they want so i decided well christ this is this is stupid this like we're transferring billions of dollars in lost margin in these things. And all the jobs were transferring. They're all going down the pipe. They're in Texas. They're not in Alberta. So I just said, I'm not, I'm going to change that. Mm -hmm. So I drew a flow sheet on a napkin. I was having a beer here one day with somebody and I drew a flow sheet on a napkin. It's got four boxes on it. That's the oil refinery. So I said, I'm building this oil refinery. They're so big. They're, they're, they're such complex things that they're just really difficult to get done. And, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into, but I thought, if it's a number, I can figure it out. And if it's, uh, you know, most of this is numbers. So we had to convince people. And the average guy in Alberta got that right from the start. If I was in 7-Eleven buying a quart of milk and, I, and somebody knew me and they'd say, what are you doing? And I'd start talking. About they'd all say, that's a hell of a good idea. Now, this is at the time when they're talking about building Keystone Pipeline. Everybody's saying, you guys are crazy. Keystone's going to take all that stuff away. You know, there's going to be no bitumen. Everything's going south. And I thought, this is a bunch of bullshit i you know i don't believe it i don't think i think we can do anything here they can do anywhere else we could probably do it better here than they do it anywhere else so i just didn't subscribe to that and for a long time it was like you know you're fighting a real uphill battle uh, but eventually we were able to convince the government so the other people think about it is you got you got government involvement in the stuff the government owns the oil 
if you're not dealing with a government, you're dealing with some – but he, who's renting it. So if you deal with Imperial, they've got a license to produce that oil, but they're not the owner. Albertans are the owner of the oil. So the Albertans should be capturing the value that's in that whole margin chain. And, you know, that's, that's turned out to be true. It took a hell of a long time to get there. And when we first started up, you know, we built the thing. It cost about $12 billion. So $12 billion, you know, to put that in perspective – when they built the Panama Canal, when they finished it off, it cost three hundred seventy-five million dollars in nineteen seven or eight or whenever yeah. when they were all was finished. Yeah, when uh-huh. you inflate that to today, that's about twelve billion dollars. So what we did there was the same economic impact of building the Panama Canal, and there was as many problems and as many things that go wrong. You can't operate at that scale without lots of problems. But in the world we're in, no one's saying that's a dumb idea anymore. The margins are enormous out of that conversion now. And one of the other things we did in it is we we made it – we had worked at Weyburn a lot. And so Weyburn brings carbon dioxide up from uh, North Dakota into Saskatchewan and uses it for enhanced oil recovery. And we had worked on that project in a couple of different ways. And so we knew a lot about it. And Pan Canadian, who was the originator of it, had sold me 11% of it back in the days in one or 2000 or something before CO2 goes in the ground. So we knew that you could put CO2 in old oil fields and essentially that oil fields would come back to their original productivity in the right kind of oil field. And so when you're making, when you're building a refinery, you've got a bunch of choices, but the refining process is essentially I take a long molecule of oil and I cut it up into short pieces and I have to put hydrogen on the ends of those pieces or they all glom back together and make a big mess. So diesel fuel is a short piece of a long molecule with hydrogen on the ends. So you have to make hydrogen. Most of the ways we make hydrogen, we make a molecule of hydrogen and we make a molecule of CO2 at the same time. And so for the last 150 years, people have been venting that CO2 to the atmosphere. So I got the idea, Chris, we could start the EOR business in Alberta at the same time we're starting the refinery. So I decided, okay, we're going to make the refinery. So the first step in it is we're making pure CO2. And if you don't make it pure, if it's contaminated with nitrogen, then it's really expensive to get the nitrogen out. So... We said we're just going to make it pure, so we got the feedstock to start the EOR business in central Alberta, and then we started another business called Enhance that is essentially doing that job now, and we also designed and conceived a piece of pipe called the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line to bring the CO2 from the refinery to central Alberta. And that pipeline goes through some of the best reservoirs in the world. You know, we have a really great reservoir in Alberta, and there's some of the best ones in the world that pipe goes through. And I, when I was looking at it, I thought, you know, that was back in the time when we started doing this. People are saying, uh, you sure CO2 isn't some kind of, you know, that, that's just a flash in the pan. That's going to be over pretty soon. People don't really believe that stuff. You know, it's just, you know, it's an opinion, but it's not well-founded. I started thinking, Christ, I don't know, my kids are like 10 years old. They believe this stuff. Like, that's who's going to be voting 20 years from now deciding this stuff. They believe climate change is real. I don't care what you believe. You're too old to have an opinion because those people are going to be the ones that decide it. So I just decided I'd just turn on my hearing aids when everybody's talking about, you know, CO2 is like this and then we don't have to do anything. I just said, forget it. We're going to do something. And so we built what is the largest operational system in the world there for man-made CO2. And it takes the CO2 to a reservoir. We put about 4 million tons of CO2 in that reservoir so far. I'm going to put a lot more in before we're done. And there's lots of other reservoirs along that route to use the CO2 in. I also had the idea when I did this, people are going to have to do something about CO2. We're going to have to sequester it, but there's an economically logical order to do it in. And the, it starts with the first thing I do is I, I use CO2 in an oil reservoir. The CO2 stays behind and oil comes out. And the people who are, you know, on the other side of this say, well, you don't want more oil in the world. I say this is the lowest CO2 oil of all oil you produce. This is the lowest CO2 intensity oil you can get out. So that oil helps pay for the system that you're going to have to build, and it makes it so you can afford it. So you do the oil first, then you do depleted gas reservoirs. So you got a space, but you haven't got anything in it anymore, so put CO2 into them. And then at the end of the day, you do pure carbon sequestration in the saltwater ocean that's below all these things. But if you get the order wrong, All it means is I do less because it's really expensive. So the order's wrong now. People want to go to pure CCS. I guess that's what we're going to do, but it doesn't make economically – it's not economically logical to me. The uh, Sturgeon refinery is one refinery. 
in the States, they've got lots. Why is it so hard to build refineries in Canada? They're expensive. When you start off, you don't know what they're going to cost. When we started on that thing, we thought it was going to cost $6 billion. It cost 12 Very few people have the balance sheet to be able to do that. And the only person who can stand that economic risk is the reservoir owner. No one else can do it. No one has enough economics in it except for the owner of the oil. And that's the point we miss all the time. It's like, oh, you know, why doesn't some private guy do this? Because he doesn't have enough margin for mistakes. When you own the oil, the margin in the oil that we're going to process through that refinery, I think the refinery is going to last around 100 years. The margin that we're going to process in it is $900 billion. That's how much margin is going through that refinery. That's how much we add to the value of the bitumen by making it into diesel over the life of that refinery, $900 billion. The refinery costs $12 billion. Well, for the guy who's only got refinery economics, if it costs 12 instead of 6, that's an economic disaster. For the owner of the reserve, I got $900 billion of margin over the next 100 years to worry about. What if it costs 12? I don't give a shit about that. I mean, it's just like the owner has to be involved. And if you haven't got the owner there, you can't do it. So Imperial behaves like an owner. Shell behaves like an owner. Suncor behaves like an owner. What do they got? They've all got refineries. I wonder why they got them. Because there's more margin there. <laughs> the nature of oil and gas is that it's commodity and that it's out of your control in terms of price and the uh, fate of investors. Sometimes management teams like to create a situation where it's heads I win, tails the investors win. But on the other hand, it's heads I win, tails the investor loses. Were you aware of the importance of putting your own money into the company to create a symmetry of risk with your investors? I don't think it's about money myself. I mean, you know, I've, I've done this lots of times, at least, I don't know, at least 10 times. We've done different variants of this same theme. When you get doing it, it's like, are you spending your life doing this? Do you give a shit about how you spend your life? I do. I will only direct my life to things that I think have th three sort of attributes. The first is it has, the place has to be better. After I finish it, the place has to be better than before I, be, before I did this. If a place isn't going to be better, I don't want to do it. I'm going to work with people and it's going to be stressful, really stressful sometimes, but everybody's going to be mad at each other. Are these people I'm going to be able to be around with? That's step two. If they are and I like them and it's going to be fun doing it and I'm really careful about who I'm with. And then the third thing is, can I make what others would think is an unconscionable amount of money? And so I have to get all three and they have to be in that sequential order. And so, you know, if I invest or I don't invest, it doesn't make any difference because once I'm committed to it, like Christ, I'm 74 now, I'm still working away. I'm not going to work on something that I think is stupid. And it's not about money. It's about it, I want money out of it in the end, for sure. They have to be financially rewarding. But, I, you know, it's kind of like water for seeds. You can't grow seeds unless you put some water on them. So that's what money is. But you still have to care about how you do it and look after it and do all those things. So to me, it's it. you don't have to be – the alignment is what are you doing with your life? And before you get money, that is a luxury. Like you can't act the way that I do because, you know, if you're starting off, Christ, you got to, you know, you got to look after your family. You got to have money start up. But after you've done it a couple of times, if you've done a reasonable job, you got lots of money. If I'm correct, CNRL was a 50% partner in the East. They were. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've had a lot of business success on your own, but one of the things I guess working with CNRL is you got proximity to Murray Edwards, the maybe business genius. What lessons did you learn from working with somebody like that? They're great guys to work with. They know what they're doing. They're tough. You, you know, they're going to hold you to account on everything you do. Mm -hmm. uh, great partners. Never, I haven't got anything bad to say about them. You know, I mean, people are shouting at me sometimes. I probably deserve to be shouted at. So that's okay. I mean, we got the thing built. It's operating now. It's operating well. I could never have made it without them. Well, maybe it gets to the uh, point you made about capital and having a partner that owns the reserve. So it's sure. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. They got it right from the start. When I was preparing for this conversation, I was reading some of your articles and one of the points was that your view on Alberta and the value of maximizing our resources and uh, really taking advantage of it for all Albertans while minimizing environmental damage. Do you still view it that way and that uh, we should be capitalizing on the I, I, Yeah, I think we live in the best place in the world. I think it's one of the most, probably the most entrepreneurial place in the planet. Sure. It's, it's 
more yeah. entrepreneurial in Silicon Valley is. That's what <laughs> I think. And I also think that we do things to very high standards here that we never get credit for. Like the largest carbon capture system for man-made CO2 in the world, we built here. It's not some Norway or it's not some guy in England. Talk. All those guys are talking all the time. But, you know, doing and talking are different things. We do stuff here and it's substantial. And we've been doing it for, you know, since the 40s here. We've been doing the same things. We do it well. We've got a wonderful regulator here. And the regulator is the source of a lot of the entrepreneurial activity we have. And, you know, uh, I, th I think it's just a great place. Along the way, was there a project that seemed to really hit it out of the park for you financially? Is there one you look back on that really um, was the best? I mean, when you don't have any money, like I went broke, right? So <laughs> I, we had zero money, like not every month I'd go to the bank. And that, so I got friendly. The, I used to, you know, I used to deposit your check. So you go to the bank, take the thing in there. So I get friendly with the bank teller. I take my paycheck over at the end of the month, put it in. She looks at my credit card balance. She looks at the checks in pretty close this month, but. It's okay. <laughs> so this goes on for like a couple of years. I'm, you know, she's a good shit and I'm friends with her and stuff. So I go in one day, we've just sold this business and my share of the proceeds is about 10 million bucks. So I, she's used to seeing my paycheck each month. I got this check. I've got a <laughs> grift in my hand in my pocket. I give it to her. So I give it to her. She looks at me and she says, pretty good month. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably, I mean, for me, that was at some point, if you got enough, then everything after that is you're looking at it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You maybe didn't have to work again after that time. At what point did you start to realize your, I guess, professional life and your hobbies needed to align and that it was kind of the same thing? Was it around that time? You know, I, I don't really think about it in that way. I, I don't really think I have a professional life. I don't think of it in that way. I think of it, is this really interesting? Is this going to be fun to do? Is this going to be complicated enough that it's going to capture my attention for the duration of the task? And do I get to meet a bunch of people and figure out something I didn't know anything about? And if it starts checking those boxes, then I don't see it as, a, you know, it's, it's just I'm doing it or I'm not doing it. And I don't really see it as a, there's no separation between there's no separation between the museum and the and the refinery. They're just one type of thing, you know. Were you always like that or did you kind of discover that when I think I was encouraged to be like that. I'm just lucky, you know, people look after me. Like we were saying in the eighties, if I'm correct, you had some problems with your business when bankrupt. Yeah. The National Energy Program. What lessons did you learn from that experience in uh times that didn't work out? Some businesses are very complex, very difficult, and they're low margin businesses. And so when you're in those, you're going to be exposed to it. You don't know when you start off. I mean, I don't know what a machine shop was. I thought, Christ, you're charging 50 bucks an hour and you're paying the guy, you know, 15 bucks an hour should be okay. Mm -hmm. And so you realize these businesses are so complex that like if you're running a job shop operation where you don't know what the work is the next day and you don't know who's going to be doing it, you don't know what the type of work is and it's low margin. Those are tough. Mm -hmm. And I think somebody who can run a, a you know, a, a machine shop that has that attribute for the customers and make money at it is one of the smartest people in the world. And so you shouldn't go into those things. Once you do it, once you're in it, you realize this is terrible. You know, like you just can't, it's too complicated. Something's always going wrong and there isn't enough margin to pay for it. So what it does though, is if you got a knife, it really sharpens the knife. And so you got a sharper knife than other people have, because you've been in this place where every Friday you're going broke. What are you going to do? And so you have to do all the things that stop you from going broke. So I, you know, I did that for 15 years. So I, I spent a lot of time sharpening my knife. Yeah. When you were getting going, how did you, I guess you just paid yourself monthly. <laughs> how did you pay the bills? You know, I mean, we started with nothing and we had started with 2,500 bucks. So it was like, you know, when we fixed something, we got the money from it. And back at that time, I was making 600 bucks a month. So if I got 700, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> what's your, uh, what's your favorite project you've ever worked on? I'd say, you know, if I look back over my life, the refinery is the thing that, that I'm happiest that, that I started and finished. And I think there's, you know, if you said, who in the world had the chance to draw the flow sheet on a napkin and then see this thing after $12 billion built and in full operation and then eventually saw it start to make money and doing all the things that you you did? I mean, that's a rare experience. To me, that that's probably as good as it gets. Yeah. 
you ended up selling your stake in the refinery. Yeah. I guess the question somebody might have is why? Uh, well, the, essentially, the people that were running the operation decided they we were supposed to get paid a, rate or, a utility rate of return. And they decided they weren't going to do that, and they didn't pay us. And we didn't have enough money to hang around, so we pretty well had to sell. In addition to your energy investments and your refineries and all that, is you, you've got a museum and you also have real estate. Maybe you start with the museum. What is the Canadian Museum of Making? So it's a collection of stuff that I thought was cool. So we have two important types of collection there. Well, three types, really. We've got a, a really good collection of African metalwork. So it's probably a world-class collection of African metalwork. I started on that because I'm interested in how – I'm interested in anything to do with metal. How do you make it? What did you make it for? What are you doing with it? And all those kind of things. So I started collecting this African stuff, and it was about the time of the AIDS epidemic. And I started to realize this stuff is being sold one article at a time. And if that goes on for a long time, and, and, and because of AIDS, people were having to sell things that were really important. There were ceremonial objects or religious objects or family heirlooms, but they had to sell it because they didn't have any money. So I decided if you sell it one at a time, you'll never be able to put it back together again. It'll just be dispersed and cast to the winds. So I found a guy who really knew a lot about it, and he worked for me for probably close to no, more than 10 years. And we had a, you know, we had a thoughtful intent when we were collecting this stuff that we want to be able to tell a complete comprehensive story that would be meaningful to somebody, uh, you know, who knew this stuff. And the plan eventually, and I, and I think I'm the temporary custodian of it. So we put it together in a way where someday we'll send it back to Africa, which is where it should be. But we want to make sure that it isn't going to get stolen. So there has to be a functioning government before we send it back. So we got African stuff. Yeah. Then we got a really good collection of uh, industrial revolution stuff, mostly machine stuff, you know, metalworking stuff, but machine shop stuff. Got a big horizontal mill engine there that we brought over from England. So it, it's a big engine. Like people think it's a steam engine, but it's a stationary engine. So it weighs about, I don't know, 60 tons or something like that. So it, it's a big machine and it's a beautiful object uh, that was uh, part of the intent with the museum was – People used to really care about how functional objects looked. Mm -hmm. And so if you had a machine in your factory, somebody would spend some time trying to figure out how do we make the machine look good. Now we don't do that. We just make the machine, and if it does its job, then that's what we're doing. And I believe that the only functional objects that outlast their, their time when they're functional are things that are made to look good. So, uh, you know, the message I'm trying to send to other engineers is if you care about, you know, you want to be remembered at some point in the future, make stuff that looks cool because somebody will save it. And then the other thing we have is a really good collection of, of – uh, have you ever seen the movie There Will Be Blood? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So Daniel Plainview. <laughs> yeah. So I've got a really good collection of oil field stuff from that period of time. And I bought it from a guy who, uh, who worked in the – he's 90 – four or five now. He worked in the oil field his whole life. So he collected this stuff up. He decided I would be a good custodian. So I bought it from him and we've been gradually moving pieces of it up from down in Coots in Montana and we move it and fix it all up and get it so it'll work again. And then we set it up. And for anyone that is listening, the museum of making is a massive footprint. How big is the museum? Probably 20,000 feet inside and then probably, I don't know, five acres outside stuff. So. Something to check out. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> if you like old junk, that's a place to go. Mm -hmm. um, you're also involved in real estate. Did you always want to be in real estate? And how did that come about? No, my my mom worked. Uh, so my mom was a school teacher. And then when she retired, she, uh, her and my dad, before they retired, actually, they bought a place out in uh, sort of west of the city, north of Ghost Lake, up, uh, on Jamison Road, it's called. And she moved out there and she taught for a couple of years. They drove back and forth. Then she retired. My mom was more energy than 99% of the people in the world. So she's sitting around. She hasn't got enough to do. So she decides she's going to run for the council. So she gets on council. And at that time, where we lived was the only place in the MD where you could divide a quarter section into four 40-acre pieces. So that residents a long time ago had decided they wanted to do that. So the MD allowed them to. And my as my, as my mom got involved with the thing, she realized – Boy, this is the start of a bad problem because when you when you subdivide these things into 40s, the 40 isn't big enough to be 
worth anything agriculturally, and it's too big to have your house on. After a while, you're thinking, what, what's all this land for? So the next step is you subdivide it again, and everybody votes to subdivide it again. And then the next step after that is, and pretty soon you've got something that looks like bear's paw. So this is a, one of the most beautiful places in the world. So you know, my mom are talking about, she's on council for a couple of years, and uh, and then she gets off. We still talk about it all the time, this fragmentation that is inevitable because it's a beautiful place. It's 50 minutes from downtown, so, you know, it's easy to get there. People can live there, drive back and forth. So I get the idea, you know, we should try and do this a different way. So I start studying on it, and we find that in the States, they've had a concept called transfer of subdivision density. And so what that means is you can move, if you have the right to develop something, you can move it around and you can optimize it. And usually what you're trying to do is reduce the amount of disruption from roads and power lines and services and views and try and get the thing in a place that makes more sense because it's smaller and more what a person needs for a residence. So we... We sort of talk about that. And then I got lucky again. So I sold something and had some more money. So I said, I'm going to just start buying land around this thing. And, and so I started doing that. I thought I was going to be a cattle rancher for a while. I acquired quite a bit of land. And then I proved that I don't know how to do that. And I don't like it either. So I decided, well, why don't I try and develop this in a way that will keep the place the way it is? So we, we picked one piece of it. We did. Um, an enormous amount of computer modeling to try and figure out what can you see, optimize all the views, make it so that you feel like you're in a natural environment. You can't really see your neighbor, but the neighbors aren't that far away. So we spent a lot of time figuring out how to do that. And <clears throat> when, then I went to the MD and I had enough land by then that I said to him, how about you let me take all the subdivision density I've got on this land and we'll put it in this one place and we'll do it as good as it can be done in this world. And because they knew my mom, they knew when I said I'd, I'd do something, I would actually do it. I wasn't like some kind of developer trying to make a fortune doing this. I was trying to, you know, there was a higher mission, which is let's keep the place looking the way it looks right now. So the council of the day believed that. So they, they allowed me to implement a plan like that. And so I've been executing that and my daughter's taking it over now. So it's, you know, this is three generations long before we finish it. Yeah. You've been involved in. Traditional energy, refineries, real estate, museums, investing as uh, Northwest Capital Partners. You've had all these things in your uh, career so far. How important do you think it is to keep interested and not get bored? To me, is I don't get retirement. I, I don't understand the idea of doing that. I think I spent my whole life getting good at doing something. And then uh, the next step is I'm going to quit doing that and go try and learn how to be a golfer or something. I was just like, this is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not doing that. And, you know, you know, for me, it's like, is this fun or not? If you don't enjoy what you do, quit doing it. Who's in charge? You're spending the most valuable currency you got, which is your time. How are you going to spend it? And if it isn't fun, if you're not smiling most of the time, if you're not, you know, engaged deeply and you can't figure, it's hard, you can't figure stuff out, find something else it is. You understand energy and power systems and the grid more better than the average Joe, probably. Energy is directly correlated to the quality of life in the Western world. Have you seen a shift back maybe to the appreciation of traditional energy and uh, the systems that we've already built? Are you seeing a shift maybe now with the current government and uh, appreciation for what we have? You know, I think a few people realize if they think of energy, well, I get in an airplane and I can understand I'm burning lots of fuel when I do that. I get in my car. I'm burning quite a bit of fuel when I do that. I heat my house. I use a lot of fuel for that. But they don't think, you know, Christ, that sweater you got on, it's got like, you know, it's 20% natural gas. Where, how, really? Boy, I didn't know that. When I eat an olive, that's got an enormous amount of energy in it. It's like the olive is probably about the, if you, if you pick an olive, it's got about that much diesel fuel in it by the time it gets here. Do I want to eat olives anymore? Or do, you know, like, how's that going to evolve? And, and that, it can evolve in different directions. I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, denier. I think that we are going to continue to evolve in, in directions, but only the big factors are knowable. The small factors are, and the way that it happens and the speed that it happens at and who does it and what. So people don't aware, aren't aware yet of how much energy is embedded in every, every action we take is based on having cheap energy. And if someone starts charging you for it, Everybody's like up in arms, right? Like look at that heating fuel thing down in Nova Scotia. That's about a tenth of what's coming through the fuel tax system. So 
people don't vote for you, well, then you have to change the rules. So, I mean, I, I believe that those kind of things are happening and will continue to happen and we'll get, we'll get to the right answer, but it's going to have lots of stops and starts. And so for somebody young, you just got to be thinking about that. If you were to give advice to maybe to a person in charge in terms of the grid and the power system and making things realistic and pragmatic, would you suggest we lean into what the resources we have and maybe keep looking towards the future and renewables, but to emphasize the fact that we, we still need our traditional energy system? Send a signal, look and say, how quickly can I achieve the objectives that I have without melting down the world? And say, okay, well, I think I could get there by this time, and I think we could do it in this way. Then give a clear signal about the goal that I have. What's the carbon intensity that I'm trying to achieve for this difference, for these different paths? Tell people that and say, we don't care how you get to that carbon intensity. Do it any way you want. We're not going to tell you, is a battery powered car better than a hybrid, better than a bike? I don't know. Do the best thing that you can do. And then the world builds that evolutionary system because people are kind of saying, geez, if I did this, I would be able to do it faster, maybe cheaper, better. And let the world decide that. Don't try and tell them what to do. And, and what I think is happening a lot right now in, in all governments of the world is they're telling people what to do. They're not telling them the answer they want. They're telling them what to do. And so when you do that, then it gets really expensive and unproductive, I think. Top-down energy policy. Yeah. It's not the right way. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like, what's what's the carbon intensity of the diesel fuel? W what do I want? I don't care if it's biodiesel or if it's carbon-captured diesel that's made in the conventional way or, you know, I use solar power to get the electricity to the refineries. I don't care. You pick the best way to do it. Here's the car. Here's the number that I want you to achieve. And if you can prove you achieved that number, good. Go ahead. Then problems will get solved. And there'll be surprising solutions that no one ever thought of before. Mm -hmm. You seen an evolution in the state of Alberta politics through the years. You've been here for a long time and seen a lot of premiers and whatnot. Have you seen a change, a major shift? Maybe some people would say to the left, or is it just different now? Have you seen things change? I'm really encouraged by what's happened in the last iteration, to tell you the truth. And what I think is, you know, it's a really difficult world now because the extremes own the end of the parties that used to be in the center are are driven in large part by the extremes on both ends. And so the extremes really don't have a – they're dogmatic. They don't have a really a properly formed opinion. They just believe something because they believe it and they know they're right. Yeah. And so to get elected, you have to appeal to that extreme. But then once you're elected, then the next question is, what do I do? And most of the people here are sitting around in the middle and they're saying, well, you know, do we want old people to, to be on the street? Nope. We want to have old folks on. So that's going to take some money. We want the hospital work, right? Yeah. Now, if you say to the hospital, well, you can't ever change anything, it ain't going to work very good. So you got to change stuff and everybody's up in arms every time you change them. So they're really tough, intractable problems. But what I think is, here we do the, we do a pretty good job, but you know everything I see is like, Christ, they're it's going okay. Uh, you see, like I said, a lot of premiers: Don Getty, Peter Lahey, Ralph Klein, all the way up to now, Daniel Smith. Yeah, was there a leader that you liked more than the rest, or seemed to do a better job? So, of the historic ones, uh, I like Lougheed, but I wasn't really old enough to know when he was there. I was in university then. Okay. But I think he did the right things for the place and was smart and an effective uh, defender. After him, I think uh, Stelmack is forgotten, but he was a very effective guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I got misaligned with everybody on the royalties in Calgary, but that was really – he did things that made sense for the place and he knew what he was doing and was really thoughtful about what the future of the place is going to look like. So – I thought he was good. The new leader, I think, is okay. I think she's doing okay. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's early days. You can't tell yet. But, I mean, they're doing sure. the right things. Yeah, And a lot of the stuff, the rhetoric, you know, the, the rhetoric that's going back and forth are exactly the same things that Lougheed was saying back in the day. I mean, it's modernized, but it's the same thing. It's like, to them, we're a colony. Send money. That's the answer. Yeah, that's what sure. they want. It seems like there's a willingness to stand up now more that's been missing a backbone, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a tough spot and i think you're dealing in a really really difficult situation and it's tough well that's uh almost an hour now i am um, yeah advice to a young person in business or careers in general 
Well, you know, there's all this crap about follow your dreams. I don't think you can, I don't think you can have a legitimate dream until you've done something for a while because you're, you're, when you're young, you're building your vision of what, how the place looks, how it works, what part of it you want to participate in, all those things. And you haven't seen enough of it to be able to have a dream. I mean, you can have a dream, but it's a, you know, it's the most academic of dreams. It's not a real dream. So when people say that to you, you know, I, I think, I don't know, I think you're misleading people when you say that to them. And what you should be saying is get enough information so that you can form your dream and then execute your dream after you get that information. But don't, don't build a career around something that you don't know very much about. And so that would be a piece of advice. The other piece of advice I would say is we're going to need energy for a long time. You know, there's a, there's this movement now where there's all this stuff that isn't going to work. Maybe it's true, but I haven't seen that in my life. What I've seen is slow, gradual uh, progressions to better places. I think we live better now. We have, you know, we live longer. We live better. We have more comforts and we have more opportunity than we've ever had before. And that's the result of 250 years of people making stuff and figuring out how to do it better, you know, improving the place. So I think that continues. And anybody that says this is all going to change by 2030 or 2035, I think, well, you don't understand how big this system you're dealing with is. It's like, shit, it took us 20 years to build a second power line in Alberta because we had to go through the whole regulatory purpose. People are talking about, you know, we're going to need a tripling of the electrical grid to do some of these announced problems. Well, I don't know how you're going to do that because all these things have an environmental approval process and all the residents get to have an opinion on them. And that takes a long time to get through. So what I think is don't believe all the hype about all this stuff. You know, it's just like form your own opinion of it. It's going to go at a rate that, that the economy and the world can afford. Don't make a decision that gets you in some kind of dead end spot it's okay to go to a dead end spot as long as you know you're in it and you're going to get out of it. But don't go to these places assuming that somebody's view of the world 30 years from now is going to be the correct view. I don't think anybody is that smart. I think the world is an evolutionary place. If you dig up a plant and you wash off the root system and you look at that root system, you're thinking, holy shit, this is complicated. How can, how can this thing? Sometimes the big root's going along and it just stops. And then sometimes a little one is going along and it goes for like six feet. How could that possibly happen? And it's an evolutionary process. It goes to where the food, water, minerals are, and it evolves that way. And that's what's going to happen with the big system that that we live in. It's way more complicated than that root system is. And it evolves and responds to, you know, it's an evolutionary response. It evolves in response to money, to rules that the government makes, to things that are happening in the environment that become, you know, become accepted truths and all of those things making it evolve in a certain way. And if you think you can predict that, you're delusional. Maybe just to wrap up the conversation, uh, who inspired you? Did you have any business leaders or scientists that you kind of look towards through your career? So, you know, I guess, if, I don't know, the people around here like, Jack Gallagher. Jack was an amazing guy. I got to meet him and talk to him, you know, and do some of that stuff. And I met a bunch of people through him. I didn't know him well, but knew him well enough. He cared about the place. He was trying to do the best job he can. And, you know, they got on a runaway and didn't end well. But, you know, I, I think really good person for the place back in the day. Lougheed, I think, was a really good political guy. Uh, big people in my life would be probably when I was a kid, I was reading about Edison all the time and all this stuff, you know, his approach to life and how it was like really a relentless grind to the end. And there was no time when, you know, when you didn't, he'd get to a point on something, you know, he used to have that lab in Menlo Park. He'd get to a point where he thought, we're close enough now. He'd tell everybody, okay, everybody bring your sleeping bags. We're not going home until this is finished. And then they'd stand there until they got it. So, you know, I mean, that, that approach to life is something that resonates with me. Abraham Lincoln, probably he's high up. I think he might be the smartest person that ever lived. So, you know, I read everything that I could read about him. That's probably it. Awesome. Well, that's a great conversation. I also have to acknowledge this may be the coolest office I've ever been in. Yeah, <laughs> uh, wrap up the formal conversation. So if anyone ever gets a chance to come here, it's uh, okay. Well, good. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. 
Until next time, happy coffee drinking. <laughs>